About 13 years ago, a few buddies and I were really into urbex. We didn't call it that back then. We weren't part of any sort of community. Nor were we into taking photographs of places we visited. We'd find some old apocalyptic-looking derelict on a Friday or Saturday night, get some beers and some smokes, then spend the night getting wasted and fantasizing about zombie survival scenarios. I pretty much settled down now. I'm in a long-term relationship, and we're even talking about having kids. I don't my girlfriend would be too keen on me exploring old abandoned buildings. But that's not exactly why I don't urbex anymore. And the reason I stopped is because of what we say at the Denver State Medical Hospital shortly before it was demolished back in 2007. So there's this movie that came out in 2001 called Session 9. We saw in the movie theater near Boston Common and were instantly obsessed. Sure, it's a good movie, but the star isn't really David Caruso. The real star is Danvers State Medical Hospital. Location scouts must have giggled like schoolgirls when they laid eyes on Danvers. It looks more like Hogwarts than the place where some of Massachusetts' most dangerous mental patients were housed. The huge Gothic building was built in 1874. And it was quite the sight to behold, seriously, Google it and you'll see for yourself. But in the early 90s, it was abandoned when all remaining patients were transferred to other sites. Once we learned that the magnificent-looking building was only 13 minutes north of Boston, we were already making plans to visit for a little midnight drinking session. One Friday nights we make the drive up there, parking our buddy's car about a mile away, before walking over to the abandoned hospital. We may or may not have committed criminal damage and breaking through the flimsy perimeter fencing. I'd rather not say anything too incriminating. I don't want to get arrested over some dumb Reddit posts. But once we were inside, it's as incredible as we imagined. The police didn't feel like it had ever been a hospital. We picture hospitals these days as being these white on steel, sterile places, but Danvers really did feel like it was straight out of the Harry Potter movie. Intricate patterns on the tiled floor, grand staircases, more like an old mansion than a treatment center. We're still in awe when we decided to make our way up on one of the staircases to explore the upper floors, wandering down long dark corridors, with the only light being from cheap plastic flashlights we were carrying. One such corridor had lots and lots of smaller rooms running off of it was clearly some kind of high security when the rooms look more like prison cells than hospital rooms that were even rusted iron shackles still attached to some of the walls. Evidently some prisoners were restrained when they became too violent. But when I shined my flashlight into another one of the smaller cell-like rooms, I froze. Caught in my torch beam was the dull steel of a steak knife. I can still remember how its teeth glittered in the bright white light. Next to it, a rather dirty-looking sleeping bag lay on the cold-tiled floor. Someone was here with us. I can't remember who said it. But one of my buddies muttered something about us not being alone here. And when a strange voice spoke through the darkness, I think all of us just jumped out of our skin. I that's all it said. At first anyway. There's a young dirty homeless guy walking down the corridor towards us. Hands up and palms out. I can't remember the exact exchange. My adrenaline was pumping the entire time, but I'll try to paraphrase. We were just about to leave, dude. We don't want any trouble. It's all good. He replied. Something friendly in his voice set me at ease. I really didn't mean to scare you guys. It's cool. Kind of a scary place anyway. He separated from what I assumed was his steak knife, but I still kept my eyes on where it was sat in the darkness, making sure he won't be able to grab it if he decides he doesn't like us so much. But as I said he was actually pretty friendly for a guy who seemed to be living in an abandoned insane asylum. We gave him a beer, a kind of peace offering, and then spent about a half an hour just wandering the corridors and talking. None of us wanted to press him on why he was there, that you seemed nice enough. So we passed the time talking about Boston complaining about the socks that sort of thing. After a while he does in fact, tell us some of his story. How he spent a drifter for a while. Not exactly homeless, but not exactly the 9 to 5 kind of dude, either. 
He liked to explore weird old places, too. So that was like another half hour listening to all the awesome abandoned places he'd visited across America. He even been to Bodie, California, which has like this legendary status among urbex enthusiasts because it's an entire mining town that was abandoned after the gold rush or something. So about the point that we're thinking this is one of the coolest guys we've ever met. He asked us something that at first, we thought was some kind of joke. So you guys are human, right? One of my buddies actually laughed, but the guy shot in this look, man, if looks could kill. He was serious. And the more it dawned on us that he was 100% serious, the more freaked out we became. I just, you know, hate meeting cool people than finding out they're reptilians you know, you can only really tell once you peel that fake layer of skin off. I mean, that's what the knife is for. He'd seen my eyes flicking towards it. Don't look so nervous. Do you guys seem cool, but sometimes it just gets real tiring. They've been after me for so long now, and they never ever stop. Sometimes think I think I should just kill everyone just to be safe. And uncomfortable silence came over us. I wanted to run from this crazy monster, but that might angered him. And we really didn't want to anger him. Dang, dude. We're almost out of beer. One of my buddies says, here, man, why don't you take our last one, we'll, we'll go buy some more in the back in like an hour. Again, probably not word for word. But I'll never forget the relief I felt when he said those words. It was a stroke of absolute genius to be able to get us out of there so quickly. Without raising too much suspicion in the guy. The homeless looking crazy person seemed very happy at this, like he'd made himself a trio of new friends, guys, he could finally trust. And as we walked out of Danvers and back towards the car, I felt a new fresh feeling guilt. I'm an urban explorer. Urban exploration or urbex, as we call it in the community is the exploration of man-made structures often abandoned or hidden from the general public. Generally speaking, photography has played a large role in its popularity, but historical documentation has also become a factor in recent years. As austerity has taken hold in the UK, urban decay has become much more prominent with abandoned factories, amusement parks, and other such places becoming increasingly common across the country. To my knowledge, the term urban exploration was invented in the mid-90s by a Canadian guy by the name Jeff Chapman. But one particularly harrowing story tells of a French urban explorer by the name of Philip Barrespare. The story goes that Monsi Espere was a hospital porter in the 18th century, who had heard rumors that there were riches to be found in the deep winding catacombs beneath Paris. Priceless jewels, golden medallions, and 100-year-old bottle of expensive spirits waited for those who were brave enough to search for them. Will Sierra Spare packs a knapsack bid his wife adieu, then wandered down into the catacombs in search of his fortune. His skeleton was discovered in the damp dark tunnels just over 11 years later. Now, I'm not sure if I believe that story. There has always been a kind of glamour that came with the apparent dangers of urban exploration. And I'd be lying if I'd said I didn't find that attractive. But the story of the French explorer seems a little too far-fetched for me. Not to mention that the risks involved these days are minimal. It's pretty much impossible to get lost and an emergency mobile phone means that medical assistance is usually just minutes away. That being said, doesn't mean you find some genuinely weird or disturbing things while exploring and not too long ago, myself and a friend of mine explored a place that actually made me question if I wanted to involve myself in urbex anymore. Just out of Farnham in a leafy rural place called Surrey in England stands an old abandoned puppy mill. The building has been deserted since 82-year-old John Lowe was arrested for killing his former partner and her daughter with a high-powered shotgun. He had shot his wife Christine Lee at point-blank range with a shotgun, later telling police that he wanted to put her down. His daughter Lucy Lee made a call to the emergency services before courageously returning to the scene of the crime to face her killer one final time and the building has a sinister air about it before we even laid eyes on it. But when we've actually seen the thing, the apprehension was palpable. It looked like a typical haunted house. 
All red brick and Victorian arches like it was just waiting to be the cover art of the next Stephen King novel. We took a few pictures nervously chuckling to each other as we made our way inside. The interior has been almost completely gutted. There wasn't a scrap of furniture to be seen in and almost all of the electrical fittings had been torn out to prevent accidental fires. The glass windows of the conservatory attached to the house had smashed wholesale, not a single pane of glass had survived some previous visit from local vandals. It only added to the eerie feeling of the place like some terrible vengeance had been wrought by angry locals trying to destroy a place that was haunted by so many terrible events. My friend and I separated as I ventured upstairs while he remained on the ground floor searching the kitchen. The upstairs bedrooms were still carpeted, but leaks in the roof meant that larger patches of black mold were growing on the walls and floors. The place reeked of rot. He had to just as I was headed back downstairs, I heard my friend call out for me to join him in the kitchen. And all the time I'd known him, I'd never ever known him to sound too scared. My initial thought was that we'd been joined by some police who'd received reports of us exploring the murder scene. The empty alcohol containers on the first floor told me that this place was probably the haunt of drug users and criminals. Hollywood take was a simple explanation. Maybe with us walking away with cautions. As I entered the kitchen, there were no signs of police, just a friend staring wide-eyed at one of the white painted walls. When I asked him what was wrong, he just pointed at the spot on the wall, he was staring at not saying a word. There on the wall was a small jagged hole in the masonry, framed by some dark muddy stain. It only took me a moment to realize just what I was looking at. There was a hole made by the shot that killed Kristen Lee. It must have been the money stain around the ragged opening, must have been her blood. I appeared closer recoiling and revulsion as I saw something that clung to the jagged edges of the roughly cut hole, a few fiber strands of something dark and glossy, matted together with the same muddy stain that marred the white painted walls. It was hair, human hair. And all my time taking part in urbex trips I had never felt so utterly terrified. I had been chased by the cops punched by angry security guards, but I had never felt like anything like this. The death was thick in the air. It was a horrible feeling, just knowing that something so terrible had happened right where we stood. I've never believed in ghosts or anything remotely paranormal. But there's absolutely no denying the feeling that came over us as we stared in horror at that hole that fatal gunshot had made. It was haunting. The place felt haunted. It felt exactly as if we were transgressing on some kind of hallowed ground, disturbing the restless spirits that lingered in the place they had so horribly lost their lives. It felt wrong. I turned to my friend, giving him a look that said far, far more than words ever could. He just nodded before we quietly made our way out of the building, not once looking back as he walked back through the woods towards town. I'm still very active in the urbex community. Although I did it take a prolonged break from it after what I saw in the low house down in Surrey. I now actively warn people against visiting former murder scenes, telling them that some places are better left undisturbed. Like I said, I'm not a believer in the supernatural, but that doesn't mean that some places aren't haunted. Not haunted by ghosts, but by the reality of just how cruel and heartless human beings can be toward each other, even by people they love. I'm an urban explorer from Scotland over in the UK, and I've been involved in the urbex community for coming up on 15 years. I've probably explored more than 500 abandoned places over the years, and at least 99% of them are exactly what you'd expect. Rundown houses, factories and hospitals, creepy enough to make for amazing photography, but nothing remotely sinister about them. Honestly, the number one feeling you'd get from urbex is kind of sadness, especially when the site in question is an old gothic building that's more deserving of investment and not demolition. I've been to pretty much every stereotypically creepy place you can imagine. Old Victorian hospitals haunted stately homes in the middle of nowhere. Several morgues and operating theaters, abandoned graveyards, creepy basements and tunnels, you name it, and I've explored it. But one place was different from all the others. Out of all the places I've explored, only one genuinely scared me a bit of background information. 
We absolutely adore finding new places. But it's not exactly easy, it takes a lot of research. And we get most of our locations from Google Maps, news articles, land registries, and the obvious shares from other members of the Urbex set. So often, unless someone has left kind of an Urbex review, we don't know what a place will be like before we turn up. Sometimes they're sealed, empty, or demolished. And sometimes I wish this place had been like any of those. We would have turned up, found the place inaccessible, and simply gone home or found a pub to drink our disappointment away. A lot of the time my urbex pals and I will organize a kind of day trip, something to look forward to and bring relief from the stresses of our boring or stressful jobs. We'll go about visiting a certain town or city that has a few potential urbex sites, and then exploring them all throughout the course of a day. We get a hotel, find a few nice places to eat, but it also helps us socialize with the locals a wee bit. After a few pints, even the most hard-hearted that people will spill the beans on derelict buildings in the area. This one place was the last abandoned building on the trip. It was getting dark and rainy as it often does and roll Scotland, but we decided to push on and get a few photos before sundown. We had a kind of a long drive to get to the hotel, so we couldn't just put it off until the following day. At first, it didn't seem abandoned, just a church in the middle of a very well-kept cemetery. My friend assured me that from his research, it definitely wasn't in use. And that was pretty keen to get inside, because abandoned churches can make beautiful photos. Only by this point, we were losing daylight at a rapid rate. We'd have to get in there if we wanted to make use of the last of the natural light. iPhone camera flashes just don't make for good photos. Only natural light produces the kind of results that get noticed on photography forums. The rotten back door to the church was wide open, old paint peeling and patches from the splintering wood. It was hardly the most inviting entrance, but the only visible way of getting into the building. One by one, making sure there was no one around report us for trespassing. We made our way inside. Now side note, a lot of urbex enthusiasts talk a good game about climbing into places through open or broken windows. Once a ruse to find service hatches and all that I can categorically say that climbing an abandoned site is definitely not a good idea. From experience. The fastest way to the emergency room is trying to climb something that is literally falling apart. Inside we came to what appeared to be a small kitchen. I'm not remotely religious. So it did kind of surprise me that whoever the priest was actually used to live in the church to that kind of dedication is something so intangible was just beyond me, but I suppose that's why they call it faith. The kitchen naturally led on to a small corridor before opening up into the main church hall. That was the last time we spoke for a long time. There were beautiful color stained glass windows, albeit a little grimy from the abandonment, but that's not what drew our eyes. A distinctly uneasy feeling overtook us as we saw just what was laid out in the hall before us. I for one was completely lost of words while one of my friends went deathly pale as if he'd seen an actual ghost in that old church. Instead of the standard empty pews and religious iconography, the interior of the church was filled with children's toys. They were stuffed neatly and uniformly into every pew, all facing the same way, forever listening to some silent sermon. All of the children's toys and dolls were worn and filthy. In a creepy kind of style that kids' toys haven't been made since like the 70s or 80s. There were little ornate prams, that strollers for yanks and matchback cars all facing the same way towards the empty priest's podium. It dawned on me that since there were no toys there, whoever had to arrange them this way I'd stood at the podium and admired their handiwork. There was also a kind of bedroom area, one bed having been clearly made up for a child and surrounded by children's books, no adult-sized beds, not a single one. So I don't think it was anything like a homeless family squatting there. How long they had been, there was anyone's guess. But one thing was clear. Whatever the reason these toys were arranged like this, it was not a good or a pure one. We left the place still in silence, to creep down to discuss the scene as we drove back to the hotel we were staying at. The mood of the whole day had changed in mere moments, it was still too raw to try to make sense of the things we had just seen.
Despite our outward appearances, the place was collapsing inside. A huge hole in the floor had formed and damp was setting in, so any evidence of the toys, the bed and the sinister atmosphere may well be lost or buried soon. I don't know if anyone else had discovered this place or knows what happened. But it's not somewhere I'll ever return to. I refuse to share the location even with my closest explorer friends for fear if that they visit, they'll run into whoever had arranged those toys into such a ghostly congregation. I've seen a few scary urbex posts on the subreddit over the past couple of days. They've been some amazing stories, but they've reminded me of my own terrifying experience that I haven't actually thought about in some time. I've never really told anyone this story, but now I feel like this is the right time. I mean, I am pretty much anonymous here. And it really has been years since this whole thing went down. I live in Liverpool over in the UK, you know, the place where the Beatles came from. It's a beautiful city with a rich cultural history. But beneath the old Victorian streets, there are old mysteries that have never been solved dark secrets that pass from the world along with the dead men who kept them. Let me tell you the story of when a friend and I explored the Williamson Tunnels. The Williamson Tunnels are a bunch of massive subterranean excavations in the Edge Hill area of Liverpool, which were created under the direction of a tobacco merchant landowner and philanthropist Joseph Williamson, between the early 19th century. Although generally described as tunnels, the majority of the complex is comprised of brick or stone vaulting. Essentially, a series of interlocking rooms have been carved out from the rock underneath the city, the purpose of the works remains unclear, although quarrying a philanthropic desire to provide employment and Williamson's own eccentric interests have all been suggested. Now, this all seems pretty harmless, just some rich old guy providing jobs for the local people. But when a local journalist by the name of Stonehouse became suspicious of Williamson's motives, he went about researching the true purpose of the tunnel network. One hearing that Stonehouse planned to publish his research on Williamson's excavations, Williamson's friends, the artists Cornelius Henderson, threatened to sue Stonehouse, both for libel and trespass, leading to his journalism being suppressed for many many years. Eventually, the British Army got involved and a mandatory survey of the tunnel system was ordered. Yet despite the massive amount of work that went into the surveying, Army engineers simply did not have the manpower to cover all the grounds. Larger excavations, such as the vaulted Great Tunnel, have yet to be located. Still think the whole thing is harmless. Now, neither did we. So it came to pass that myself and a friend of mine will come I'm Chris began to plan a clandestine exploration of the Williamson Tunnels, namely the parts that hadn't already been explored. We stocked up on a few snacks, two flashlights each along with a lot of batteries. There was no way either of us was getting caught short in some dark underground tunnels. That would be like the start of a bad horror movie or something. Some warm clothes one first aid kit between us, and we were set. I gotta say it was incredibly exciting, planning a little expedition like that, knowing we'd be venturing into places that no one had stepped foot in for almost 200 years. We joked about finding a huge stash of treasure, Spanish, gold, and silver two balloons, but I think I have believed we might. Why else would a man dig so deep into the earth unless he had something really worth hiding? The whole real way to get inside the tunnels is to use the official visitor's entrance. The plan was to get inside look like a pair of well-meaning tourists, then hide out somewhere until closing time when we would have the place to ourselves. Simple, but effective nonetheless. Naturally, it worked. We found some dark corner as far deep as we could manage without cutting away at the chain-link security fencing that kept us from the deeper recesses. After 5 p.m. a solitary security guard made one final sweep of the public areas with his flashlight, turned off the main power and then went home for the evening. Maybe it was a bit early to be high-fiving each other, but we were still pretty ecstatic that the first phase of our plan had gone off without a hitch. The next phase involves finding a way around the previous mentioned chain-link fences that had been erected to keep tour groups from venturing into restricted supposedly dangerous areas. With a little help from a pair of pliers my friend had borrowed from his dad's toolbox we were and we got out our flashlights and began to wander deeper and deeper into the unknown. 
It didn't take long until we were hopelessly lost inside an unending series of pitch black rooms. I had assumed that there would be some sort of order to the layout. But each adjacent room seemed to take us deeper into what had to be a huge labyrinth underneath the streets of Liverpool. The deeper we got, the more debris covered the floors, chunks of human limestone that we began to stumble over as we pushed on I noticed that my ears were popping just in time to hear my friend let out a yelp as he slipped among the rubble and crashed into the rocks beneath him. It looked bad. I rushed over to him struggling to find stable footholds among the rocks and was incredibly relieved to discover that all he had were a few cuts and grazes. I don't quite know why I did this at the time. Maybe it was because I knew from the look on his face that he had had enough. But I left him for a few moments to go see if there was any of that treasure stashed away in the rooms ahead of us. Of course, he wasn't there when I got back. But of course, he wasn't there. When I got back. Of course the room he was sat in was empty. No sign of him anywhere. I was kicking myself. He'd obviously gotten annoyed that I'd left him alone and was now marching back on his own, bleeding and tired. I tried to find him heading back as fast as I could to catch up with him. There was no sign of my friend at all. No torchlight in the darkness. No one responding when it caught his name. And it was about at this point that I started getting pretty freaked out. Either he was playing a bad joke on me or there was something terribly wrong. Then, from the rooms behind me I heard footsteps, not walking pace. Not at all. These feet were sprinting. Hurtling through the rooms towards me in the darkness. I wheeled around and shined my flashlight, relieved beyond belief to see my missing friend. But his face. I've seen the look of tears so etched into someone's features. He didn't have his torch or his backpack, and he almost crashed into me as he sprinted through the tunnels. He just whimpered one single word as he ran run. To this day, he's never talked about what he saw down there that made him run like that. He started drinking a lot, even getting up late and getting drunk all night. It wasn't long before we drifted apart and he ended up moving down to Portsmouth, way down in the south of England. He was never quite the same after it, but that doesn't mean I haven't stopped wondering and one day maybe over a few drinks I'll ask him. But it's not asking him that I'm afraid of. It's what he might tell me. That right really scares me.